Welcome to Grace. We're so glad you guys are here. Welcome to those of you online as well. You know, last Sunday we kind of kicked off our fall series, Food for the Soul. And if you didn't get in on the you know, first week of it, you can still join in and hit this connection corner here. After the service, you can go and talk to one of our staff and they can get you hooked up with a small group as well. Uh, let's pray before we look at the Word. Let's pray. Father, here we are. <clears throat> Gather together the people that you love. We ask that you'd have your way now. Speak your word into us and make us more like Jesus because we've been here. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Well, there was this guy. and He was invited to be a speaker at a very special dinner gathering. And as he got there, he was seated at the head table. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on him that he forgot his false teeth. So he looked at the person next to him and said, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I forgot my teeth. The guy next to him reached into his pocket, pulled out some false teeth and said, try these. He put them in. He said, oh, those are too loose. He said, hold on, I got another pair. He said, try these. He, oh, those are too tight. He said, I got one more pair. Reached in, said, try these. He went, ah, they fit perfectly. So he went on to eat his meal, then he spoke. Then after the meeting, he went and found that guy he was sitting with, and he said, he said, thank you so much for helping me out. You know, what is your address? Because I'm looking for a good dentist. He said, I'm not a dentist. I'm an undertaker. You got to watch out for the assumptions that you make. People make a lot of assumptions about the Bible, and sometimes those are a whole lot more serious than just leaving a bad taste in your mouth. So we want to go ahead and continue our series that we kind of kicked off last Sunday in Food for the Soul, really learning how to study the Bible. If you remember, I gave you three words that are real important words in Bible study. Observation, interpretation, and application. And that order is very important. If we don't do a good job with the observation, then it's very likely that our interpretation could be off the mark. And our interpretation is off the mark, then of course our application also uh, would be bad. So it's important that we really have observation. What do you see? Really looking carefully at the text, what is there? Pay attention to words and places and verbs and context. What do you see? And then interpretation, what does it mean? What did it mean to the original readers and what does it mean to us today? And then application, how does it work? So, what, so how does that you know, affect my life and how I live my life? How does it work? And what we decided what we do is we would take each Sunday and we would take one of the seven churches that is addressed in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, and we would actually just have a message on that church. But as I'm given the message, I will also try to point out some important Bible study techniques that we all need to know. And so it was kick off this morning by taking Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, where Jesus addresses the church the church that is in Ephesus. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever wondered what Jesus would say to a church if he was the guest speaker one Sunday morning? You ever wonder what Jesus would say to this church if he was our guest speaker today? You know, we don't have to really wonder what Jesus would say to a church or churches because as he addresses these seven churches that were historical churches, he's addressing them and about issues that they need to pay attention to. Now, these seven churches that he addresses were seven specific historical churches in the country that we know now as Turkey today. It was Asia Minor back then. But I want you to notice something, that even though he's addressing specific churches, I want you to notice how he ends 
what he says to each church. It's important when he, that we notice this. This is an important observation. Revelation 2, verse 7, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice the plural, to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's notice it again. Revelation 2, 11. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So we know right away, if we're good, doing a good job with the observation, that even though Jesus is addressing specific churches, like in this case, Ephesus, he ends the address by pointing out that this is a warning to more than just that church. So these these these. Uh, Messages were to be shared with other churches, and they were to learn and benefit from what was said to that church. Again, now before we go very far in our study, it's important in doing Bible study that we understand the broader context of the book. In this case, of course, the book of Revelation. We need to know a little bit about the whole context of the book of Revelation. Now, Jesus appears to the Apostle John and gives him an important message. Notice this, Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. That tells us a lot right away about the book of Revelation. There's going to be a lot said from Jesus to John about what is to take place in the future. Revelation 1, verse 11, Jesus also says to John, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis, to Philadelphia and Laodicea. Also, Revelation 1, 19, Jesus says to John, therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. So what we know now about the book of Revelation is the Apostle John <clears throat> is instructed to write down the revelation that Jesus is giving to him. And when he writes it down, he finishes it, it is the book of Revelation. Now what we discover now, again, this is important to have this broad view of the book. In fact, if you really want to study a passage in any book in the Bible, it's good to get, read the whole book and understand some things about the whole book before you just jump in and grab one verse and run with it. Now, what we discover when we read the whole book of Revelation is that there is a cosmic battle between good and evil. There's a spiritual war going on between Satan and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the war is this war is over the loyalties of people on the earth. This is important that we understand what the spiritual war is all about. The spiritual war that's going on on the earth right now is primarily about the loyalties of people. Spiritual warfare is primarily about the loyalties of people. Well, are they loyal to Christ? Or are they loyal not to Christ, but even if they don't know it, they'll be loyal to the enemy. Now, the seven churches addressed in Revelation 2 and 3 are under spiritual attack. They're under spiritual attack by the enemy. Now, the attack is not primarily, it's not particularly unusual. The devil's been using these same tactics that he's going to use against these seven churches he's been using throughout history. So the more we learn about his tactics the more likely we're going to be able to overcome those tactics against us. Jesus is going to instruct each church how they can overcome the spiritual battle and remain faithful to him. Remember, spiritual warfare is about the loyalties of people. What the devil is trying to do as he attacks any church, including ours, is to get us to cease being loyal to Christ, to somehow turn us away from Christ. That is his goal in spiritual warfare. 
You can talk about all kinds of attacks and temptations and oppression and all that, but the ultimate goal of the devil is to get us to turn away from Jesus. That's his goal. And what we're told by Jesus is how to overcome the devil's attack and stay true to Jesus. Notice this, Revelation 2, 7. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Revelation 2.17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him, I'll give some of the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. So Jesus is telling each church how to overcome. Overcome what? Overcome the devil's attack to get them to turn away from Jesus. It's about the loyalties of the people of the earth. That's what spiritual warfare is all about. Now, it's important that we do notice that overcomers are not a special class of Christians. All true believers will find their names written in Lamb's Book of Life. All true Christians will have everlasting life. All true Christians need not fear the second death. All true Christians will not go to the lake of fire. So the point is, all true Christians are, in fact, overcomers. The evidence that you are a true believer is that you do, in fact, overcome the enemy's attempts to turn, you, turn your loyalty away from Jesus. Now, these seven churches are instructed by the Lord Jesus himself on how to overcome. It's important that we understand that's what's going on here. How do you stay true to Jesus in the midst of the devil's attempts to turn us away from Jesus? How do we stay true to Jesus? So today and over the next six weeks, we're going to study each of these churches and see what Jesus tells them they must do if they're going to overcome the enemy's attempts to undermine their loyalty to Christ. And as we do, the Lord is going to speak, I believe, directly to us as a church. We're going to, there's some things in each of these churches that the Lord will take and he'll speak to us because this, these are letters to the churches, including us. All right, so the first message is delivered to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. What we're going to notice when we read this passage is that this letter, the letters are addressed to the angels of each church. Now, in the past... I think I taught this uh, 10 year, years ago, 15 years ago in the past. I just went along with what most commentators would say, that the word angel is also the word for messenger, and he's probably addressing the pastor of each church. Now, the problem with that interpretive decision, because now we're making an interpretive decision here, what does the word angel mean, is... We have to make sure we do right observation if we're going to get the right interpretation. Now, if we have a Bible concordance, which every Christian, I believe, should have, a Bible dictionary and a Bible concordance along with a good study Bible. If we take a Bible concordance and look up this word angel and then notice where, everywhere it is used in the book of Revelation, what we'll see is that everywhere else in the book of Revelation is clearly a reference to a supernatural being, not a human. So for us to take, to then go to this one place it's used and, and automatically interpose our idea that it must be a human he's talking about here, because we can't understand how an angel would be over individual churches, really violates good Bible study. Good Bible study would say all throughout the book of Revelation, everywhere this word angel appears, it is reference to a supernatural being. So if we're going to be consistent, why wouldn't it be a supernatural being here in Revelation 2 and 3? Now some of you say, well, that's, I've never heard that before. Now we do know clearly from the book of Hebrews that we each have a guardian angel. In fact, if all of them were to manifest right now, this room would be so filled with light, we'd all be on our faces. We all have guardian angels. Have you ever thought about each church having a guardian angel? 
You say, well, I don't know if I, I, I agree this possible. Well, think about it for just a moment, because if you study Daniel chapter 10, we learn there are principalities, high-ranking angels over countries. There are fallen angels fighting for the loyalties of that country, like the angel over Persia and the angel over Greece. We read about this in Daniel 10. So why wouldn't there be an angel over each church? So again, I'm just giving you some things to think about regarding Bible study, but also it's a different perspective. And why wouldn't the Lord want to do that? Dispatch angels over the things that matter so much to him. And don't we matter so much to him? Well, let's read now the passage. Revelation 2, verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the golden lampstands, says this. Now, all we've got to do is go to the previous chapter, and we know the one who he just described is Jesus Christ. The glorified, ascended Christ. And he's going to say something now. Verse 2. He says this, Now to this church, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance. Now, Remember those three words. I'll come back to those three words. Remember, we're trying to also teach some Bible study as we go through these passages. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But... Verse 4, I have this against you, as you have left your first love. Okay, so Jesus has something against the church in Ephesus. Now, we need to learn a little bit about Ephesus. If he had a Bible dictionary, or he, you can have an app that does the same thing, we find out that Ephesus was the number one port city in the Roman Empire at that time. So it is a happening place. I've been to uh, the excavated city of Ephesus three times, seen it at different levels as I continue to do excavation there. It is an amazing place. And so as, as you study, you don't need to go there to study this. You can read so much about it in a Bible dictionary. And again, that helps us do right observation so we can get the right interpretation and then live out the right application. One thing you'll learn about Ephesus is that it is, was steeped in paganism and the occult. The temple of the goddess Artemis was there. What was left, the only thing left there is one big long pillar because it's 3,000 years old. It also was full of idolatry and witchcraft. It's important for us to know this. But Jesus focuses on the one thing that he had against the church in Ephesus was that they had left their first love. This is real important for us to remember. That was their main problem. Their main problem was a heart problem. They no longer had Jesus as their first love. Other things became more endearing to them than Jesus. They gave more of their affection and attention and allegiance to some other things above Jesus. They lost their first love. They left it. Now, what we do know is they are still gathering. Even though they left their first love, they're still having meetings. They still went through the motions of, of doing church. They had come to a place where stuff on the outside looked okay, but Jesus is pointing out that on the inside it was, it was wrong. It was off. They left their first love. And this happens to a lot of churches. Church can have right doctrine, and that's good. Church can have deeds and works and perseverance, those three words. And that's good. But this church, though they had those things, lost their first love, and that was bad. They lost what they once had. Now, some 35 years earlier, again, just reading more in a Bible dictionary, you can find out. It was about 35 years earlier, the Apostle Paul 
wrote the Ephesians and commended them for their faith and their love. Commended them for it. But now, it, some 35 years later, it had become a shell of what it once was. Now, I want, to see, I want you to see something now where a Bible concordance would be helpful. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, I want you to notice something as Paul addresses the church in Thessalonica. He says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. First Thessalonians 1, 3, notice this. Constantly bearing in mind, listen, look at this, your, your work of faith and your labor of love and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. So works, labor, and endurance. These are the same three words, same three Greek words as Revelation 2. You can find that out with the Bible Concordance, simply looking those words up and seeing other places those words appear. But what I want you to notice is that as these words are used in 1 Thessalonians, they had work, but it was produced by their faith. And they had love, but, it, it, but um, labor, but it was prompted by love. And they had endurance, but it was inspired by hope. True faith in God leads to good works. Faith without works is dead. A true love for people leads to labor for them. Otherwise, it just degenerates into mere sentimentality. A true hope, which looks expectantly on the Lord's return will lead us to endurance in the face of difficulty and opposition. So let me ask you this. What has happened to a person or a church when it no longer has work produced by faith, it just has work? And what, what has happened to a person or a church when it no longer has labor produced by love, it just has labor? And what has happened to a person or a church when it no longer has endurance inspired by hope? It just has endurance. So what has happened to a person who just works and labors and endures, but they don't feel anything anymore? They don't feel anything toward God. They don't feel anything toward other people. They're ambivalent about the return of the Lord. What has happened to a person or church that get, gets that way? You ever know a church like that? You ever feel like that yourself? Some of you might feel like that right now. Well, the church in Ephesus got that way, and Jesus tells them how they got that way. They got that way because they left their first love. Now, I was thinking about this just this week. That it must have been very difficult for the Apostle John to write this. Because if you did a little bit more observation, you would really uh, learn that the Apostle John actually lived in Ephesus before he was exiled to Patmos and afterward as well. He knew these people. He knew them when they loved Jesus first and foremost. He knew them then. And now he has to write this down that their love has grown cold. They've left it. Jesus is no longer first they lost that simple love relationship with Jesus out of which everything is supposed to flow. They lost that. So the Apostle John, who spent decades of his life in Ephesus, he probably wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John from Ephesus. And he was likely leading the Ephesian church when he was arrested and exiled. And he has to write what he has to write here. I just think it was a painful moment for him. John, who wrote the Gospel of John and, and wrote about the importance of intimacy with Christ in John chapter 6 and wrote about the importance of abiding, abiding in the vine in John 15, that same John has to write this. And they, when he says they left their first love, he knew they. Who knew, he knew who they were. So this is a recurring strategy of the devil. He knows if he, he can get us to neglect our relationship with Jesus. He knows that if we just think this right doctrine is all that really matters and good deeds is all that matters and we're just fine, he knows that eventually if we, if we learn to think that it only matters if it's good on the outside and we become the shell of what we once were, he knows, the devil knows, that eventually our loyalty to Christ 
will also fall. And getting us to turn away from loyalty to Christ is what the devil's goal is. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to focus on Jesus. We're supposed to keep falling in love with Jesus, abide in him, talk with him, walk with him, listen to him, lean on him, worship him. It's all about communion with Christ, intimacy with Christ. Everything flows out of that. If we do that, then we'll have faith to work. Then we'll have love to labor. And then we'll have hope to endure. It flows out of a loving relationship with Christ. Now, perhaps some of you are here today, and in all honesty, you'd say, I think I've left my first love. What do I do? Well, Jesus tells us what to do. Let's read on. Revelation 2, verse 4. But I have this against you, that you left your first love. Revelation 2, 5. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds that you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. So he tells us, that if we've left our first love, do these three things. Remember, repent, and redo. Remember, remember what it was like when it was, just, it was easy to love Jesus and do ministry and it was fun and everything was light when it came to the, the, you know, the, the weight of the Lord. And Remember that and then repent. Turn back to that. You've gone one direction, turn back and redo. Redo, do those things you did at first, some of you used to spend a lot more time with the Lord than you do now. Jesus says, redo. Go back to that. Go back to that pattern. There's a pattern that produced intimacy that you don't do that pattern anymore. Jesus says, go back to it. Go back to that pattern. Now, what if you don't? What if you have left your first love and you do not do what Jesus says to do? You do not, you know, remember, repent, and redo. What, what, what's he going to do? Revelation 2, 5, therefore remember from where you fall and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Now the lampstand is the light of the church. And we see in a previous chapter, Jesus walks among the lampstands. There is a connection between the manifest presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in a church and that church being a light to the world. A really important connection. There is a connection between the manifest presence of Jesus in a church and that church being a light to the world. So if the church doesn't repent and come back to Jesus as their first love, what will they lose? They will lose the manifest presence of the Lord in their gatherings. And with that, they will lose their ability to be a light to the world. And that church, in a sense, ceases to exist as a church anymore. They still meet together, but the lampstand's gone. Still have, you know, events, projects, but they no longer have the presence of the Lord in their meetings and they will not have any light and they'll make no difference in the world and that church will simply become irrelevant and ineffective. And Jesus removes a lampstand from churches like that in order to keep them from reproducing themselves because we don't need any more churches like that. So if you left your first love, it's no small thing. The word of the Lord says, Get it back. In fact, there's nothing more important for any of us if we left our first love today to do than to get it back. How? Remember. Repent. Redo. Just remember. Remember what it was like when just loving Jesus was everything to you. Repent. Go back to that. Redo. Do the pattern that you did to develop that kind of intimacy and communion. So much is riding on this because everything is going to flow out of that. All our ministry is going to flow out of there. Our life will flow out of that intimate relationship with Jesus. Now, Jesus did commend this church for something. Verse 6, even though they were in an unhealthy spiritual condition, he commended them for something. Revelation 2.6 says, Yet this you do have. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. 
So who are the Nicolaitans? Well, you look that up in a Bible dictionary. You find out they're followers of Nicholas. And we learn a little bit about what they apparently believe. They believe it's okay to eat the food sacrificed to idols. In fact, it was okay to fornicate several pagan practices. They decided were really okay. Well, basically, the followers of Nicholas believe it's okay to have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. It was okay to even love things that Jesus hates. And Jesus hated that. He still hates it. Jesus still hates it when professing Christians love the very things he hates. Jesus hates that. So I just got to ask you, are you embracing something in your life that Jesus hates? Then repent and get it out. Spiritual warfare, the first thing the devil wants to do is go after our communion with Christ because he, he knows that if, if, he can't, if he can't stop us there, he can't stop us. If he can get us to stop really connecting with Christ, then eventually we start to compromise with the world and eventually he could turn our loyalty away. I believe the next 10 years we're going to have our loyalty to Christ tested, challenged, and attacked more than any of us have ever experienced. So we better have our first love intact, or we'll be easy prey. Remember, Jesus tells us in the last days there's going to be a great apostasy, a great falling away. Many professing Christians will fall away from Christ. The loyalty battle will be lost by many. Many will not be overcomers. So, my, so the point is, how can I make sure that I'm not one of those who falls away? Here is the key. The key to not falling away is to keep falling in love with Jesus over and over and over. Let's stand. Ask Joey to come on up as we close in prayer. Father, you know everyone's heart here. You know where everyone's at. And Lord, we just want to ask you to, to do business here in this meeting Lord Jesus, you are here in the meeting, and we're asking you to have your way with every heart. You know who's left their first love and who needs to repent today. As we close, I just we don't have the time to pray for those who I just I pray, Father, would you just make us a safe place to be honest before you and, and real with our family? Some of you are saying, you know, that's me. I need I need to repent today and, and and, just, and, and I think it'd be helpful just to, during the song, just, just kind of get out of your seat, walk down here and just say, Lord Jesus, I'm remembering, I'm repenting, and I'm redoing today. I've, I've let it slip, and I'm coming back to it. And then we're going to close by praying for you. So, Father, just pray that it would be easy now just to be honest and, and, and receive from you as we sing this song. So, Lord, I pray those who right now, even right now in their heart, they know that's them, that they need today, this, is a, this message was to them, and this is the day to repent and to, again, to turn back and make you first and foremost in their love. So, Joy, go ahead and just start singing. As we're singing, just go ahead and come on down if that's you. We're going to pray for you, and then we're going to close the service.
Lord, do this. Let's pray. Let's just pray. Father, we do. We, re- we repent from putting anything above you. Lord Jesus, anything we put before you, we repent from it. Right now, we repent from it. And we put you first and foremost. That's the one we love above everything and everyone else. We love you. You're our first love. We come back to that. I pray, Lord, you enable all of us to redo those things that we did when we were walking closest to you. And Lord, we pray that you would manifest your presence more and more in the days to come at Grace Community Church and the light would shine into the community and around the world because of it. Lord, I pray none of us would miss this message to this church today. And we thank you in the name of Jesus.